right close at hand. It's just stunning. And now, and then Ashton Carter shows up. What can I say? Okay, so we have the NSA. Uh, that's you know that's important. They've got that one locked up. So they got the World Bank, the USTRs. They've got you know vice presidents and presidents. They've got the NSA's, the intelligence community lined up. And said, "Holy mackerel, these guys have had a headlock, if you will, a hammerlock." on the American executive branch since 1976, and nobody has, nobody's writing about it still to this day except me. There's a few, no, there are a few. But I'll tell you, I've been jumping up and down for almost 40 years in this, John. Got blacklisted once by beat out bookseller, and I'm probably blacklisted by everybody else right now outside of our own efforts to sell it. But you know what, I don't care. At this point, I've been doing it 40 years. I'll do it 50 if I live that long, 60 if I live that long. I'm not gonna change my story because I know it's right. We've got the facts. We've got the documentation that shows it. So then the question comes up, we have to ask, what is the new international economic order? That's the fair question. What is it? They said it, I didn't. What is it? Well, according to Brzezinski, it's the Technotronic era. That's what he called it, specifically. Yeah. It's a controlled society dominated and managed by an elite. That's what Brzezinski predicted. In this system, Congress is irrelevant and useless, and this is an important thing to see as well. Congress has been neutered. If you haven't, if people haven't noticed it, they have no, they have no influence on anything the executive branch does these days. They I, really I think we've noticed that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's shocking. This is why they have they have pull themselves aside, and they have rendered Congress irrelevant and useless, and this was the design from the get-go. Even back in the 1930s, technocrats hated politicians because they believed that they did not understand the technology they were trying to govern. And that's why the world was screwed up. They hated politicians. Um, the new international uh, economic order is global banks and multinational corporations being the primary actors and planners of economic life. We, Brzezinski said that. It's continuous surveillance over every citizen because in order to manage the, the planned economic system, you have to have monitoring in place to do it. There's files containing all personal information for instant retrieval, and we've seen this. This is, this is also part and parcel of the new economic order. And so then as we look at what's being transformed, they say, you know, we kind of look, go back to the big picture. Well, there's a transformation taking place in all these different areas. I'll tell you, John, back in the 1970s, somebody, honestly, somebody sat down in a conference room at a university or a boardroom or somewhere and said, how are we going to transform the world to make it fit our economic model? It was just exact. I know that discussion took place because I see the evidence of it today and it working out. So I know somebody had it. Things don't just happen by random chance. They happen because people plan them that way. So economics has been transformed. You say, well, <clears throat> okay, how has economics been transformed? The United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, U-N-E-P. Yeah. On their website, they have this statement, quote, a green economy implies the decoupling of resource use and environmental impacts from economic growth. These investments, both public and private, provide the mechanism for the reconfiguration of businesses, infrastructure, and institutions, and for the adoption of sustainable consumption and production processes." Close quote. That's a simple definition of the green economy, which is technocracy. They propose decoupling resource use from economic growth. Now, as an economist, I can promise you that this cannot be done. Resource use is necessary for economic growth. You have inputs in your business. If you make 10 cans, you need to, you need to have aluminum and electricity. If you make an automobile, you have to have all kinds of parts as inputs. They're resources. Your economic growth is directly dependent upon the resources that you consume. That only makes sense. We've lived with this for all of history. 
and all certainly all of our lives. So when they say that the green economy is going to decouple resource use from economic growth, <laughs> snap, snap. How does that happen exactly? Snap, yeah, how does this happen? Well, you see, you can't understand how this happens unless you go and study technocracy. That's what I did. I went back and I studied. What are they talking about? All the way back to the 30s and then all the way forward again. Now, there's another problem with the statement. They say that the investments being made in the new green economy, they're public investments and they're private investments. That's you know, Here we go with the NGOs and corporations and stuff. Yeah. And taxpayer money. But then it says those things provide the mechanism for the reconfiguration of business, and if you own a business, I say do whatever you want to do with it. It's your business. I don't care how you reconfigure it. You know, turn it on its head if you want. If you don't do it right, you're going to be out of business. But then it says the reconfiguration of businesses, infrastructure, and institutions. Okay. What do they mean by infrastructure and institutions? Yeah, really. Now they're talking about government and society, you see. Okay, well, if you're going to re if you're going to reconfigure our institutions, that is our republic, for instance, that has a constitution, for instance, what do you have in mind? Uh, how are you going to re how are you going to transform us and reconfigure us to fit this new oxymoronic uh, cognitive dissonant <laughs> economic system that you're shoving down our throat? Yep. What, this is specified, John, how they're going to do it. But this statement is shocking as to how the economy is being transformed today. We'll, we'll talk about this a bit more. Government is being transformed. This is unbelievable, too. In 1993, Bill Clinton pops up and says, quote, our goal is to make the entire federal government less expensive and more efficient and to change the culture of our national bureaucracy away from complacency and entitlement towards initiative and empowerment. Well, the words initiative and empowerment are corporate words. <laughs> They're not public service words. When you have empowerment in a corporation, you have the corporate mission statement behind you to basically go and whatever you do, we don't care what you do. Just make sure that you carry out the corporate mission statement. That's empowerment. It gives people down in the organization boldness to go out and invent any new scheme that will move the corporate entity down the road. This is what Bill Clinton proposed to do to the United States government. And so we see Bill Clinton, we'll see in a minute, Bill Clinton came along and he started an initiative called Reinventing Government, just laid it right out. And he set about to reinvent the American government. Mm -hmm. And we wonder today why our governmental system is so screwy and disjointed and seemingly out of control. This is why. It has been reinvented by these same trilaterals that are bringing technocracy to us. Okay, religion is being transformed. This is amazing. In 2014, the World Council of Churches issued a statement on the Interfaith Summit on Climate Change that took place in 2014. And this is what they said. This is unbelievable. Quote, there has never been such a large amount of religious environmental activity in one location in the history of the world. This week will mark a watershed in the history of religion. It will be the time that people remember as the time when the world's faiths declared themselves irrevocably as green faiths. Can you believe this? Because the World Council of Churches, is, is they were identified as the Communist Party with a collar on decades ago. <laughs> Here they are. There they, they are. They've gone green now, the Pope, the Pope just a few weeks ago gave a speech. He's down in South America, I think, or somewhere. But he gave us, oh, no, he's in, the, uh, in uh, Malaysia, I think. He gave a speech about uh, climate change. And in the speech, he said, 
by June of this year, because there's a big uh, global convention coming up this fall on climate change. The UN is sponsoring it. All the world leaders are going to be there. The Pope said that he wants to, he that he will be overseeing the encyclical that will be released on climate change in June of this year. This is something you want to watch for. Because when the Pope makes a statement just out of the blue in a speech, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just the Pope has an opinion, and just like anybody else. But when the Catholic Church issues an encyclical, that's an altogether different story. Now it's being moved in to official church doctrine. <laughs> and the, the definition of encyclical is what, Patrick? Well, an encyclical in Catholic terms is uh, the issuance of a formal opinion that is not, it's not quite canonized, if you will, into you know, the core of the Catholic religion, but it is an opinion that is expected to be executed, you know, to be followed out. And so uh, it would be, you know, how could I say it? It, it might be roughly comparable in, in our congressional system to say, well, uh, Congress passed a statute on a certain thing. Yeah, I just, I just uh, that's good. That, that's, uh, that's even better. I just <laughs> looked it up. A papal letter sent to all bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. But that's, that's the extent of the definition. Yeah. <laughs> I think it needed to be a little fuller than that. Yeah. So, well, here, you know, the, the point is the religions, the major religions of the world have all been convinced to go green and to adopt climate change as their primary thing. Who is now, this pope to come and, and lecture? Uh, isn't he going to go before Congress sometime this summer? I, I, th I thought that's what I heard. He's going to talk about immigration. He's going to mm -hmm. talk about global warming. And uh, I suspect there'll be a UFO component in there, too. <laughs> John Podesta, by the way, is the, the UFO guy. Uh, he was a senior advisor to president for climate change up, up until just recently when he went off to manage Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mm -hmm. um, John Podesta is Mr. Climate Change. Uh, he, he worked for the UN for a while, and uh, <clears throat> he, was, uh, he is credited as creating Obama's policy for climate change single-handedly. He's a member of the Trilateral Commission, by the way. Yes. And as he exited his position, he said, the only regret I have serving the president for this last year and a half or two years is that I did not succeed in, in getting all of the classified documents on UFOs sprung. <laughs> it's like this guy, it turns out he's a major UFO guy and he believes, totally believes in UFOs and he wants to get all the documents exposed and you know get everybody all worked up over UFOs. So, you know, go figure that. Maybe that's just a hobby to him. I don't know. But it was kind of an odd statement coming from the mo one of the most prestigious climate change guys in the whole world. He's, his biggest regret is he didn't, he didn't, you know, get, he didn't help the UFO community get all his documents. I, you know, I can, I'm, I'm not going to try and figure that one out right now. Right. <laughs> Let's talk about transforming law. Please. Law, law is a problem. The traditional rule of law that we have known for 250 years is a problem for these people. Sustainable development cannot survive in the rule of law. In fact, it could get nowhere. And so we have this new concept in legal circles now called reflexive law. It's nothing like we know as the rule of law. Reflexive law is reiterative. Uh, it reflects upon itself. And basically, it's kind of a loosey-goosey type law that you can, if you are if you know how to operate it, you can make the outcome come out any way you want. Reflexive law. It came out of Germany as a, as a formal doctrine in 1984, three or four, something like that. And it swept the, the sustainable development community. And this is what, this is one quotation out of a legal journal. That I popped out. I the only way I could find out about this was to go and read legal journals because it was still buried. The public has no awareness of reflexive law, and I might add, all of the environmental lawsuits that have been lost in the last 25 years yeah. have been lost because they were being won by the other side using reflex techniques of reflexive law, and the defense attorneys 
in our country 